Hong Kong. Once the world's fourth biggest stock market and a center of global finance has fallen from grace. On November 28, 2023, Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index was overtaken by the Taiwan Stock Exchange Index for the first time in 31 years. The next day, November 29th, the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee passed a bill that would repeal the privileges and immunities granted to the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office. The Hong Kong office had been treated on par with an international organization in the U.S., but if this bill is passed by both the Senate and the House and comes into effect, Hong Kong will no longer receive special treatment. This is a significant downgrade in the international community. The cracks are becoming increasingly visible in Hong Kong's once unshakable status as a financial and trade powerhouse. Is Hong Kong's decline inevitable, or is this just a temporary setback? Meanwhile, foreign capital is flowing out like a tide. As of 2022, 18% of foreign companies have already withdrawn from Hong Kong. Although official statistics are not yet available, it's likely that the situation has worsened. Even funds raised through IPOs on Hong Kong exchanges this year have plummeted 59% compared to the same period last year. The number of IPOs has also contracted, falling 16% below the 10-year average. This downturn is reflected in the Hong Kong Index, which has shed 50% of its value since 2021. So, what dimmed the lights of Hong Kong? once a shining example of economic vibrancy, cultural influence, and tourist attraction. The fundamental cause of Hong Kong's economic downturn can be traced back to the national security law implemented in 2020. Since the enactment of this law, foreign capital and elite talent have been leaving Hong Kong, leading to a prolonged economic downturn. The national security law is a law that allows the Chinese government to punish anti-establishment figures in Hong Kong, and prohibits interference from external forces. The law can impose a maximum sentence of life imprisonment for acts deemed threatening to national security, such as national division and regime subversion. As you can see, the interpretation of this law is ambiguous, and we all know what an ambiguous law implies. It means that the law becomes a tool for those in power to declare someone guilty or innocent at their discretion. To understand why the Hong Kong security law came into existence and its implications, we need to briefly look into the history of Hong Kong and China. Hong Kong has been inhabited since the Neolithic era, roughly 6,000 years ago. Initially settled by people from inland China, it became part of China under the Qin Dynasty in 214 BC. In 1839, the Opium War between the Qing Dynasty and Britain led to British occupation of Hong Kong Island in 1841, formalized by the 1842 Treaty of Nanking. The region developed rapidly under British administration, especially after many wealthy Chinese fled mainland turmoil during the Taiping Rebellion and settled in Hong Kong. Following the Second Opium War, Britain also acquired Kowloon and Stonecutters Island, further expanding Hong Kong. At this time, Hong Kong's unique identity that we know today, a fusion of Chinese and British cultures, emerged, forming a distinct culture. On December 8, 1941, at the same time as the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan invaded Hong Kong, leading to British and Canadian surrender on December 25th. Under Japanese rule, Hong Kong faced severe hardships, including food shortages and inflation, causing the population to drop from 1.6 million to around 600,000 by August 1945. Post-war, the population rebounded as mainland immigrants escaping the Chinese Civil War settled in Hong Kong. The establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949 prompted many to flee to Hong Kong, and several companies relocated their headquarters there. This influx of people and businesses fueled Hong Kong's economic boom. The establishment of the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, north of Hong Kong's border with mainland China, increased Hong Kong's influence in finance and taxation, transforming its industry from manufacturing and textiles towards advanced services like those of developed nations. The notion that Hong Kongers are not Chinese gained traction due to the growing economic divergence between Hong Kong and the mainland. From the 1970s to the 1990s, Hong Kong flourished, gaining international recognition for its dynamic film industry, burgeoning cultural tourism, and robust financial sector. However, as the 20-year lease for the new territories neared its expiration, 
concerns about Hong Kong's future intensified. Negotiations between Britain and China over the territory's sovereignty culminated in the 1984 Sino-British Joint Declaration. This agreement stipulated the transfer of sovereignty from Britain to China in 1997, but crucially, it also guaranteed Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy for 50 years as a special administrative region. In essence, while Hong Kong would return to Chinese rule, the agreement promised continued legal and economic independence under the principle of one country, two systems. Hong Kong's one country, two systems is a form where a capitalist economic system coexists within the communist political system of China. At first glance, it might not seem problematic. After all, Hong Kong is not a producer or exporter of goods, but a financial hub, and as long as the promises are kept, there should be no problem. The people of Hong Kong thought the same. However, as everyone knows, the promises were not kept. While the first few years after the handover saw relative calm, the 2001 controversy over residency rights for mainland Chinese children born in Hong Kong marked a turning point, initiating a period of tension and growing anxieties regarding China's intentions. As mentioned earlier, people born and raised in Hong Kong do not consider themselves Chinese. If asked, they would answer that they are Hong Kongers, not Chinese. Hong Kongers are well aware of China's history of unjust actions and the international perception of China. In this context, in June 2012, a problem arose when a Hong Kong newspaper published an advertisement showing a giant locust in a threatening pose. This advertise was a derogatory view that likened mainland Chinese to locusts devastating crops. As the number of mainlanders coming to Hong Kong for childbirth tourism increased, Hong Kongers became dissatisfied, believing that these mainlanders were consuming Hong Kong's precious resources, and this sentiment was blatantly expressed in the advertisement. Considering that the advertisement was approved from the bottom to the top level of the newspaper, it reflects how people living in Hong Kong view China and how they believe they are different from the Chinese. Two years later, in August 2014, China began to deviate from its initial promise of autonomy and the direct election of the chief executive for Hong Kong. Instead, it proposed that Hong Kongers should elect the chief executive from a list of candidates pre-selected by China. This suggestion sparked widespread protests among Hong Kongers. Many citizens took to the streets of Central, the downtown area of Hong Kong, for weeks, engaging in peaceful demonstrations. In response, the police attempted to suppress these protests using tear gas and heavy-handed tactics. However, the police actions only incited more people, including students, to join the protests, which continued to grow. During this time, the image of protesters using umbrellas to shield themselves from police tear gas became emblematic, leading to the naming of these demonstrations as the Umbrella Revolution. The relationship between China and Hong Kong seriously deteriorated as a result of the Umbrella Revolution. In Hong Kong, anti-China sentiment reached a level where Chinese people were universally detested. This situation led to a surge in localist movements demanding greater autonomy from the Chinese government. However, while the majority of citizens were discontented with China, the political landscape began to fragment. The protesters who supported the yellow side, opposing the mainland, became distinctly separated from those aligning with the blue side. This political division resulted in a societal rift. Subsequently, events such as the Mong Kok fishball incident, a clash between police and citizens over the regulation of street food vendors, and the Causeway Bay bookseller's disappearance case, where booksellers critical of the Chinese leadership mysteriously vanished, further intensified the tensions between the yellow and blue factions. The tense situation, which had been simmering since the Umbrella Revolution, exploded in 2019, just five years later. In June 2019, Hong Kong citizens took to the streets again to oppose the Fugitive Offenders Amendment Bill. This bill would have allowed the extradition of criminal suspects to mainland China, Taiwan, Macau, and other regions without extradition treaties with Hong Kong. The bill faced fierce opposition from Hong Kongers, who feared it could be used by the Chinese government to suppress political dissent in Hong Kong. 
The concern was that even for minor crimes, one could be sent to mainland China for trial, where outcomes were uncertain. Even those who hadn't committed crimes could be falsely accused. Given China's capabilities, this was a significant concern. Nearly 2 million people, considering Hong Kong's population of about 7.5 million, participated in a peaceful march. The Hong Kong police responded with strong suppression, but the Hong Kong people were not willing to back down, believing the passage of the bill would be the end of their home. However, the protests were unexpectedly cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Seizing the moment, the Chinese government passed the Hong Kong National Security Law. After the law's enactment, the police began a massive crackdown on key figures opposing China. Furthermore, the Hong Kong electoral system was reformed to ensure only those loyal to China could run for office in the legislative council and executive positions. As a result, in May 2022, John Lee, a former police officer and pro-China hardliner, was elected as the chief executive of Hong Kong. This led to the economic decline of Hong Kong, as the Chinese government is not a fan of the free economic system. Consequently, companies have started to leave Hong Kong, and people are following suit. Major companies like Deutsche Bank, Standard Chartered Group, and FedEx, which had offices in Hong Kong's skyscrapers, either vacated their offices or moved to the outskirts. With foreign companies leaving and Chinese firms unable to fill the gap, Hong Kong's economy began to decline. A Chinese expert at Goldman Sachs posted on Weibo in mid-November 2023 that Hong Kong's stock market's average daily transaction volume barely surpassed $10 billion, and 53% of all stocks had almost zero trading volume. It's astonishing that one of the world's top four stock exchanges has reached this state. It took a century to establish Hong Kong as one of the top three financial centers, but it seems to have taken less than two years to turn it into a financial center ruin. It appears nearly impossible for Hong Kong to regain its former glory. The U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission has stated that Hong Kong's transformation from an international city to a Chinese city is complete, and there's no reason for the capital that has left to return. Hong Kong is no longer the city we knew. It has become just another Chinese city, and its people have lost their autonomy. However, there are places enjoying prosperity due to Hong Kong's decline, notably Singapore. This is the story of the downfall of Hong Kong. Once a global financial hub, now a haunting silhouette against a lost horizon of prosperity.